I've tested this once high-end graphics card at both 1080p and 1440p and to be honest I think it's probably one of the most underrated used GPUs right now because this thing's got some seriously decent value. This video is brought to you by Fifine and their AM8 Dynamic Microphone. No matter if you're a budding streamer or content creator or if you need that extra audio quality in party chat, Fifine's AM8 has you covered. Featuring both an XLR and USB-C input, along with a 3.5mm headphone jack for headphone pass-through. Gain control and headphone volume can be adjusted with the dials on the front of the microphone and switching to the back there is a tap to mute button. RGB lighting is present and it's customizable via a button on the front of the microphone so you can suit the lighting to your style. For more information check out the AM8 down in the description below. But that wasn't the case six years ago. When the RTX 2080 launched, Nvidia were kind of banking on the fact that RTX was going to carry this GPU. Even though RTX was a very poor feature set back then because there was only one game that supported ray tracing properly, which was Battlefield 5, and the original DLSS was, well, it was pretty bad and DLSS didn't even get good until DLSS 2. And pair this with the fact that the rasterization improvements over the Pascal lineup of GPUs, that wasn't particularly brilliant either. So yeah, this is why this graphics card kind of flew under the radar back in 2018. But six years on in 2024, you can find one of these on the used market for around 190 quid. I paid just 175 because it was supposed to be a GTX 1080 Ti or something like that. It's a bit of a long story. I've got it in a video linked up there, but watch that one after you finish this one. But regardless, I think it's a very good value on the used market right now. And to see how good the value from this graphics card is, I've tested it at both 1080p and 1440p, and I've even thrown in some ray tracing results as well as, after all, it's an RTX graphics card. All testing has been done on my test bench system, which has a Ryzen 5 7600, 32GB of 6000MHz CL36 memory, a Western Digital SN770 2TB NVMe Gen 4 SSD, on a MSI Tomahawk X670E motherboard. The driver I've used, and I've remembered it this time, is 5585. I've actually remembered it that time, and it's the latest one at the time of testing. With all that being said, let's get straight into it. The first title up today is Jedi Survivor, and as we know, this game is, well, it's not the most optimized title in the world, but 73 FPS on average at 1080p, with the 1% lower just above 45 frames per second means it's relatively smooth all things considered by Jedi Survivor standards so 1080p performance is totally fine. Where we do start to see some problems though is 1440p. Not even touching 50 FPS on average and that 1% lower just above 30 is not particularly great performance, but then again, you can always enable DLSS to get a very nice playable frame rate in Jedi Survivor. Cyberpunk 2077 on the Ultra preset sees brilliant performance at 1080p, 1440p kind of not so much. So it's basically like Jedi Survivor, but with better 1% lows in terms of performance. Then again, at 1440p, you can always enable DLSS and you'll get a nice clean looking image and you'll get some nice frame rate as well. But Cyberpunk, it's fairly passable on a 2080 on the Ultra preset. Looking at some esports gaming performance with Fortnite and you're going to be fine across both resolutions. That is because on DirectX 11 with the medium preset, you're good enough for 234 FPS at 1080p and 1440p, you're still good enough for around 170 frames per second. Do bear in mind though, if you wanted more frames, you can always drop this onto low or use the performance API. Here, you will be able to get absolutely incredible frame rates but I'd recommend a pretty strong CPU if you were to use either of those settings. So as long as you've got a relatively decent CPU, Fortnite's performance with a 2080 is going to be totally fine. Moving back to the AAA games with Hogwarts Legacy and both 1080p and 1440p are relatively decent here with 1080p getting above 80 frames per second on average, but 1440p drops one FPS below 60. In my opinion, this is playable, but if you wanted more frames, you can always drop this down to the high preset 
where it will still look brilliant at 1080p and 1440p and you'll be getting a lot of frames so if you're playing at 1080p leave it on ultra if you're playing at 1440p maybe drop it to the high preset or do some settings tweaking and you'll be good to go a game where you won't be needing to do any tweaks is spider-man remastered both 1080p and 1440p here are perfectly fine 125 frames per second at full hd and 90 fps at quad hd means leave it on the very high preset you don't need to do any settings tweaking here because this is very playable in my opinion and you shouldn't need to do any tweaking here and maybe and i haven't tested it today you could do 4k if you were to use a bit of dlss that's always an option as well the next game isn't so much as a game it's more of a spaghetti code mess and that is because it's starfield on the medium preset we didn't get above 60 fps at any resolution today and this just goes to show that this game is not optimized well at all particularly on nvidia and intel graphics cards i've seen it's definitely more of an amd sponsored title which yeah that's what it is so starfield yeah it doesn't perform great on either one of these graphics cards and you will probably need to enable dlss or maybe use fsr freeze frame generation because that actually does work quite well Flipping that on its head though is Forza Motorsport on the high preset and this game actually surprised me because I thought it wasn't optimised that well but performance today was totally fine to be honest. Getting triple digits for the average frame rate at 1080p is very nice and 79 fps is brilliant as well. Also the performance is nice and smooth as the 1% lows are quite close to the average frame rate so I've got absolutely zero complaints with Forza Motorsport. I've also included some ray tracing results as well, but I've decided to separate these from the main rasterization benchmarks as not many gamers actually do like using ray tracing. However, it's not really doable in Jedi Survivor because 51 FPS on average at 1080p and 38 at 1440p with texture popping issues we were running out of VRAM at Quad HD. So does this mean I recommend ray tracing in Jedi Survivor? Certainly not. Keep it to rasterization. The performance is way better. And to be honest, it's hardly noticeable in this game in a way, apart from the FPS drop. Cyberpunk is an example of a game where ray tracing has been executed perfectly, but it does take quite a bit of a toll on the hardware. Setting ray tracing to the medium preset, so it's not even on high, it's on medium, sees below 60 fps for both resolutions 44 fps at 1080p and a hollywood cinematic 26 frames per second at 1440p basically means ray tracing is not really that doable in cyberpunk 2077 keep it to rasterization on an rtx 2080 setting ray tracing to high in hogwarts legacy results in below 60 fps performance for both resolutions today because 58 fps on average at 1080p and 43 frames per second at 4040p basically means yeah it's playable but do you really want to be playing at those frame rates no not really so i don't really recommend ray tracing in hogwarts legacy either where you could make a case for ray tracing is spider-man because at both resolutions the 2080 got above 60 frames per second on average so you could make a case for it here and maybe if you were fine with a 60 frames per second performance ray tracing in spider-man is certainly a thing you can do but i'm not too keen on ray tracing in this game as it does make the reflections look quite a bit noisy for some reason i'm not too sure what that's about so the RTX 2080 is absolutely brilliant at rasterized performance, particularly at 1080p. Today it performed very well in pretty much every single game tested today. The only outlier there was Starfield and to be honest it's not really that much of a game. It's an absolute spaghetti code mess. It's one of the worst PC ports I've ever seen in my life and I'd say it's as bad as GTA 4 or Saint Row 2's PC port because both of those games were absolutely atrocious when they launched and so is Starfield because on a GPU of this caliber you should be getting more than 60 FPS at 1080p medium settings that's an absolute joke to me it's nothing on this graphics card because yeah Starfield only seems to be optimized for AMD GPUs which kind of makes sense because it is an AMD sponsored title but then again it's still a massive joke if you ask me but taking a look at the rest of the AAA games i tested today apart from jedi survivor at 1440p 
every game ran above 60 FPS. And even in the case of Jedi Survivor, just enabled the LSS at 1440p, it'll look better than native and it's basically free performance anyway, and that will get you above 60 FPS. I'm hoping because the port for that game is not particularly brilliant either. But if you look at other titles, 1080p, you're going to be totally fine. And in 1440p, you could always enable DLSS or do some settings tweaking and you'll easily get above 60 FPS on this card. It's really not that much of a hassle for it. Also, the 8 gigabytes of VRAM are totally fine for rasterized 1080p and 1440p, even with high textures. And thank you to that 256-bit memory bus, you've got more than enough memory bandwidth as well, especially compared to newer 8 gigabyte graphics cards like the 6600 XT. That's only got a 128-bit memory bus. So in terms of memory bandwidth, the 2080's got it. And like always, esports games are going to be perfectly fine on this GPU. You're going to be getting stupidly high frame rates where your CPU is going to matter a lot more than the graphics card. And because it's an NVIDIA GPU, you also get reflex low latency as well, which is always a bonus, particularly for you esports gamers out there. So yeah. Conversely, the ray tracing performance is passable at best. The only game where I'd probably recommend enabling it in is Spider-Man Remastered, but then I don't think the ray tracing looks particularly great in that game. It looks all noisy and weird, so I wouldn't really recommend enabling it in there. And the other titles like Jedi Survivor and Hogwarts Legacy, it doesn't really give you that much sort of graphical fidelity at first glance. and you're basically cutting your frame rate in half, so I don't think it's worth it. In the case of Cyberpunk, you are losing a lot of frames, but you could probably tweak a few settings around to make ray tracing very playable on this graphics card, particularly at 1080p, and ray tracing in Cyberpunk is probably the best implementation of ray tracing I've ever seen, because it actually makes the game look a ton better. But obviously that does come at a cost, and can the RTX 2080 really ray trace that well? No, not really. I'd recommend keeping it to rasterization, but if you really wanted to enable ray tracing, this GPU can kind of do it, which is the good thing about PC gaming because you can choose the settings you want to play at. So the performance is good, particularly in rasterization at 1080p and even 1440p, and the technology is good in this thing because DLSS and all of those pretty nice features. So why is this GPU flying under the radar? And the main reason is Nvidia went all in on RTX back in 2018. Back then the RTX feature set is nowhere near as good as what it is now because ray tracing was very limited to basically Battlefield 5 at the time and DLSS, as I said when it launched it, it wasn't great at all. It's nothing like what it is now because DLSS 3 and DLSS 2 to an extent as well is very, very good and it's definitely the best upscaler on the market. Also, it didn't really add that much to the rasterization performance at launch over the GTX 1080 and when you factor in the cost of $699 where this Asus Strix model probably would have cost more than that because yeah, they are quite high-end graphics cards. So a lot of people were reluctant to upgrade, particularly with the lack of rasterization improvements or lack thereof substantial ones at least and they thought they would have been rewarded by upgrading to the generation after this, which was Ampere, and if you could have bought one of those GPUs brand new, it would have been really good, but yeah, we all know what happened between like sort of 2020 and 2021 with graphics cards. It wasn't good. But jumping forward six years, if you can find one of these for less than 190 quid on the used market, I would say it's an absolute banger of a GPU and I paid just 175 and I've seen listings as low as like 150 quid for one of these and at that price this GPU is seriously good value. It's similar to an RTX 4060 and 3060 Ti in terms of rasterization performance. Yeah in terms of like features and particularly ray tracing it will probably fall behind but I'm not really that concerned about that and if you're just concerned with rasterization the RTX 2080 is very, very good. So if you want to see how another graphics card gets on, there will be a video up there. With that being said, I'll leave this one here and I'll catch you in the next one.